Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the King and Pocket Aces. I'm one of your hosts, Pocket Aces Anthony Aniano, and joining me as he does each and every week on the King and Pocket Aces show, the man where we get the king from, Mr. Scott Angle. Scott, another great episode in line here. How are you doing today, my friend? Doing good, doing good. Very busy. You know, baseball's in full swing, seasonal in DFS. Uh, the NFL draft is coming up. Uh, the fantasy basketball playoffs are right around the corner, so we're going to get to that. Get to that too. Uh, NASCAR's in full swing, but you see, I'm ready for the fantasy basketball playoffs with my new Knicks hat. Yeah, you're ready for basketball. I'm supporting my very early in the season first place New York Mets. We're both we're both in oh, a good I'm, place. I'm with those guys too, you know. Oh, I know you are. Trust me, yeah. I know. But, um, but but this is this is my new one. It's like. It's actually one of my favorites right now with the old classic logo. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, if, so you haven't gle- if you haven't gleaned it already, because I, you know, I have a different one every week. I'm pretty much a hat collector. Yeah. We, that has been noticed. Um, I'm not, yes. I like my black hat and I roll with that every week. I, I, you, I didn't wear a hat last week and it got a lot of commentary on how slick my hair looked, but it made me feel a little uncomfortable. So I put the hat back uncomfortable you look sharp yeah right now i know but that's that's not that's not me i don't want to look too sharp i don't want you know people googling me um you know i want them to love me for my fantasy sports, what about the, for my pretty face what about googling you that you could google me google me yes google me only my wife's allowed to do that that's for okay. sure but anyway all right scott so let's start off first off guys head over to rotaballer.com right Check out everything there. The main page, the premium package, the expert chats, whatever you're looking for, baseball, football, basketball, MMA, eSports, PGA, NASCAR, daily or or season long, whatever format. Uh, Sign up for that MLB premium package or any of the premium packages. Use the promo code KING. Get a little discount courtesy of Scott or the promo code ACES and get a little discount courtesy of me, Anthony Aniano. So make sure you take advantage of that. And, and stay right here on the Rotable YouTube channel or wherever you listen to your podcast and check out all the great content, including all the prior uh, episodes of the King of Pocket Aces and some of my YouTube videos as well. All right, Scott, let's talk a little fantasy baseball to start. And I sent out a tweet the other day because I'll be honest, nothing annoys me more than fantasy baseball Twitter 10 days into the season. It, it drives me absolutely insane. Akil so, Badu for MVP. I mean, it, 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 and who were we cutting? And, and you know, I, like I reminded people on this tweet I sent out, um, I said, the season doesn't end till October 3rd. We still have six months. We only played about 10 games. We still have a, 150 players at I, I most was, have I was, about. I was beating up Michael Florio on the Sirius XM show because – after four days, he's like, I'm in first place in Pout Wars. Yeah, you shouldn't even be looking at the standings. Um, you know, and, you know, there's still – the most at hitters still have about 500 at-bats. Somebody put on Twitter, um, my, uh, Michael Conforto is, is barely an everyday outfielder. Stop. He has 21 at-bats on the season so far. Like, he has 500 more plate appearances coming his way. Guys, you know, Scott and I both preach it stop playing fantasy baseball like you're playing fantasy football and calm down. Um, you know, and, and you, what I'm seeing, you know, the roster ship now of some pitchers off of a good start or two good starts. We're talking 12 innings. Scott, it just seems people are just, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like it almost they, they're playing it out wrong in my opinion, Scott. In rotisserie, everything's cumulative, so you have to exhibit more patience. But still, if you fall behind early, you, you get you get uneasy. I get it, but I really don't even check my standings that often this early in the year. I think around mid-May is a good time for an evaluation. People who play in head-to-head, though, treat it more like other fantasy sports because every week is a win or a loss or a bunch of wins and a bunch of losses – so playing head to head is different than rotisserie because you have to ride the hot streaks and avoid the cold streaks. And it's very tough to do in fantasy baseball as compared to other sports. That's why I personally prefer rotisserie. That's what I'm used to playing, but Hey, everybody's yeah. different. 
Yeah, I'm a rotisserie guy as well, whether it's my chicken or my fantasy sports. Uh, I am a, I am definitely I'm, a rotisserie I'm, guy. I'm, I'm fried. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> but so what I want to talk to you about today is a couple of pitchers off to super hot, high, uh, super hot starts whose roster percentage has already increased tremendously since, since uh, draft day, really, since the start of the season. And the first one, Scott, is Matthew Boyd of Detroit, who's now up to uh, on Yahoo. We'll use the Yahoo numbers just for simplicity. Who's sitting at about 57% rostered at the time of, of this recording. Okay, 30-year-old lefty. He's pitched 19 innings, and he's pitching to a 1.86 ERA. We'll deep dive into the other numbers in a minute. But I want to ask you, is he somebody you're buying the hype on? Is he somebody you're trusting? Or is this a case, in your opinion, of Matthew Boyd having a decent little 19 and a third innings pitch so far this year? The Tigers are actually playing better than people expect. You mm-hmm. know, look at Wilson Ramos, six homers. And Akil he's still going to finish with about 15. But anyway. Yeah, Akil Badu, MVP, right, so far? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, April MVP. Uh, we've always known Boyd has had the potentials and the Tigers potential and the tigers have a lot of talent on that staff you know casey mize a uh former uh number one number one pick in 2018 and boyd's always had that strikeout potential two impressive starts out of the gate i did draft him in one league as my sixth daughter and i'm very satisfied although we haven't gotten a lot of strikeouts yet he has changed his pitch arsenal he's going more to the slider and the change up than he did in the past. And so far, the results are there. When you see a pitcher change his arsenal, that can go one of two ways. And let's look at Joe Musgrove, who's dominated not only the two starts this year, the first two starts this year, but also last year because he developed a new curveball that's really freezing hitters right at their knees. The league still hasn't adjusted to it. Baseball is a constant game of adjustments. The, He's featuring a different repertoire than he did. He's changing his pitch mix, and that always throws the hitters off. They watch a lot of video, et cetera. Let's see what happens when people start adjusting to Boyd's new pitch mix. I would pick him up, but I would remain skeptical, and I would take it week to week, start to start. The talent is there, but you know this could be a change that means – he becomes a much more reliable pitcher go, going along. We, I, I don't think we can necessarily say that he's going to look like this all year. It is possible. The talent's there. The changes have been made. Let's see how he adjusts when the league just about, adjusts back to him. So you talk about the changes he's made. He's using his fastball about 8% less of the time. He's increased his slider usage by about 6% and his changeup percentage by about 5%. So <clears throat> that's how that change in pitch has been. Now, keep in mind, everybody, you know, when you look at Matthew Boyd, he is pitching to an ERA under two right now at 186. That expert is sitting at 4.54. And this is a guy with a career 499 ERA. Last season was terrible, 6.71. And he's never come close to that K per nine inning rate that everybody fell in love with back in 2019 when he was striking out 11 and a half batters per nine innings. Since then, he's never been even over nine. But I agree with you. He's somebody where if you have an injured pitcher at the back end of your rotation um, or, or, or just somebody who hasn't worked out. I know staff, staff. I said staff. Um, <laughs> um, Matthew Boyd is somebody who can kind of uh, give you a spot start or two if with the good match. I mean, you said it. Detroit is playing very, very well. Um, Scott, another pitcher. Must who be was- April. Must be April, right? That's, that should be the name of the show. Must be April. All right. Corbin Burns. Now, Corbin Burns is not Matthew Boyd. He was definitely higher rostered coming into the season. He was rostered pretty much across the board. But at the same time, I don't think Corbin Burns was thought of as, you know, the second coming of, of Bob Gibson. But here is Corbin Burns, all right, striking out almost 15 batters per nine innings, hasn't issued a walk. Okay, his ERA is under one. Uh, uh, Is Corbin Burns a sell high because he's been so dominant that the reality is is he's going to walk batters. He's going to give up runs at some point. 
is, is this the best we're going to get at Corbin Burns? And is somebody who we want to, you know, take advantage of this ridiculously hot start? I think it's very tough to sell high in fantasy baseball on a guy like this because he's got to prove a lot more. And obviously the numbers you threw out are not sustainable. I mean, the whole Milwaukee pitching staff is looking really good early. Uh, You know, all of them are. So Corbin Burns can certainly be a nice depth piece for you. I wouldn't expect him to keep it up, especially when you look at his career numbers. Uh, But you can't sell high on anybody. Like I say, fantasy baseball Everybody who plays fantasy baseball is more of an expert level. Fantasy baseball players are more at an expert level than any other sport because you have to be totally dialed in on 23 to 30 players every day and every week. So you can't throw one over on somebody for Corbin Burns and sell high for him because they're, you're not going to get a great return. You know, you can do these t- type of things in fantasy football where you have 16 games and a guy starts hot for a week or two. Uh, you know, for the most part, the most part, you're not going to be able to sell high on Corbin Burns. Take what you can get while you can get it and hope he remains serviceable. I mean, 12 and a third innings, he's allowed two hits. One of them was a home run, has not issued a walk, and has 20 strikeouts in 12 and a third innings. To me, Tyler Glasnow's numbers, who's been just as dominant, more trustworthy right now than Corbin Burns. Corbin Burns off the chart. Um, I, I, you know, I agree with you. Tough to sell high. But, I mean, I still see him settling into an ERA of about three. So, understand there might be some outings coming up where he gives up a few runs. Again, Staying- it's, it's like Matt Boyd, though. Is he going to continue like this, or is the league going to adjust back to him? You know, look, looking at his track record, what are you expecting strikeout-wise? I, I Give me a strikeout per nine, nine. Let's say 10 Ks per nine innings. I'm, I'm, that's perfectly acceptable. Okay, so he's going to give you more than a K per inning. That's where I figured. So if he finishes the season at 150 innings pitch, keep in mind he's only gone six innings both starts so far. If he gives you 150 innings pitch, give him 165 strikeouts. So that's nothing to sneeze at. Uh, I just think the ERA will correct itself, obviously, and we'll settle in at about three. And those are terrific numbers, but especially, you know, especially for way, for for way way you you drafted Corbin Burns, you know, you yeah, you, you didn't you didn't expect this necessarily, but when a pitcher starts off this good, it's you know because he's doing something different, and we have to see how the league adjusts to him. But going six innings. You know, you talk about nothing to sneeze at. We're seeing a lot of starters early in the year just not going that kind of lake. Yeah. And we're just starting to see that this week. Yeah, I mean, middle relievers are requiring picking up more wins right now that, than starting pitchers is. That's just the way the game is is going. Starting pitchers, other than your elite level guys, are just not going deep into games. Scott, you mentioned Milwaukee and how good their pitching has been. Freddie Peralta, eighty-two percent rostered and. 24 years old. And we've seen glimpses of this from Peralta in the past. Fastball about 52% of the time. The slider about 39% of the time. And another pitcher who I I think we expected to be good, but again, off the charts good, over almost 17 strikeouts per nine innings in 13 innings. Now, ERA is terrific. XFIP is, is reasonable. The walk rate scares me, though, and that has me a big pause of concern a cause of concern for Freddie Peralta as he continues to walk batters higher than you would like. What do you think? Well, let's hope he doesn't turn out to be Robbie Ray, but the strikeouts have really been there and he hasn't been burned too much by putting runners on base yet, but eventually that left on base percentage, that strand percentage is going to rise over time and it's going to come back to bite you. But, you know, he's the type of guy who could also, you know, put two on and strike out two in a row so, you know, you're probably going to have to balance the strikeouts with maybe it hurting your overall whip, you know, over the full season. But there's no doubt that this guy was a late round sleeper. And, uh, you know, this, this is looking like he's going to be his best year yet. 13, uh, in 13 innings pitched, nine walks, 24 strikeouts. I love the comp you made to Robbie Ray. Now he's only given up five hits and one earned run. So it's tough to hit but he's going to get himself in and out of trouble with that nine walks. And it is a bit of a, a hurt to your whip, right? To your ratios. 
if he's going to continue walking batters at this ratio. So I'm going to ask the same question. If you could trade away Freddie Peralta for a bat, um, you're not going to get an all-star, but a good bat, a slumping, let's say hypothetically, Freddie Peralta, you're able to get Michael Conforto. You willing to do oh, it? I take that in a heartbeat. That's what I'm saying. Yep. So you're yeah. selling high on Peralta. But People are going to love I that game. I thought you were going to throw Jazz Chisholm at me or something like that. And, you know, no, I, see, that, that to me, to so that's a push that. trade. That's a push trade to me. Um, okay. Is, that, is, any, is any savvy fantasy baseball owner, though, really going to give up Michael Conforto for Freddie Peralta right I'm now? I'm telling you, I think they would. I think they're going to – if a team is struggling with the pitching – and based on what I'm seeing and the lack of patience people are showing, going back to what I said at the start, I think the lack of patience people are showing, you got hitters that are struggling and pitchers that are dominating. And I just think pitchers are going to, players are going to jump at some of these dominant pitchers after such a small sample, Scott. Uh, I, I just, I, I'm, I, I have a feeling that for some people, the game is changing a bit. They're growing way too impatient. And they're going to give up on a hitter after 50, 60, 70 at bats and jump on a pitcher after 20 innings because well, the, the K he, rate is through the roof. Here's what that issue comes from. We're coming off a 60 game season. You have yes. to remember that. And when guys got into slumps and it snowballed because, say, you know, Yelich didn't hit well for 30 days, you know, somebody like that. Wow, I only have 30 days left in the season. I'm going to continue to press. You know, we've seen that with a lot of hitters who are bouncing back because it was a different mentality. You know, I've spoken to people about the majors ar around this. Last year was that truncated season. And if a guy got into a slump very early and it lasted a month, then, you know, wow, I only got 30 days left. I'm just going to press some more. The season's over. Bam. It's not like previous full seasons where you would get to the all-star break and say, okay, I had a bad first half, I'm going to pick it up in the second half. We, we, we got into, uh, some fantasy players got into a mentality of a 60-game season and not being able to be patient. You have to rewind to 2019 yeah. now and have some more patience. Remember, this is not last season, okay? Yep. If a guy gets into an early slump and he's not good for the entire month, it's like the Mark Teixeira rule. Mark Teixeira was always bad in April yeah. and then he would kill it for the rest of the year. I mean, so Scott, he mocked to share in mind when you want to be too hasty. I mean, our good friend, and I love him real talk graph, wrote a baller, one of wrote a baller's finest. And he has some fun because he can't stand the Mets, but tweeting me, he's telling me that Lindor is done at 26 years old, you know, because he's struggling. I mean, and that's my point is there are people who are just, not slow playing this and this isn't you know you're not throwing something in the deep fryer for two minutes here it's going in the slow cooker and you're going to let it marinate you're going to let it cook and it's going to come out eight hours from now and it's going to be delicious that's how you got to play you're always fantasy baseball. always making me hungry well, there you go you know, my especially friend especially when we film this close to dinner time but i saw that exchange <laughs> between, between you and raf yeah you know, about he was getting on francisco lindor in game two and Lindor game has, two, game yeah, two, <laughs> at the, at the game two. Uh, I, I think it's way too early to call on a, on a ten-year contract uh, after yeah. game two that they spent too much money on this guy. <laughs> uh, you know, because every play, every player goes goes through their their slumps at the plate early on. You know, Lindor's not hitting with runners in scoring position, but he's getting a few hits here and there, and he's been terrific in the field. Yeah, uh, you're just gonna have to wait. If somebody's gonna have a mentality like that, you know, go ahead and trade for Francisco Lindor because there are it's going to happen. Sometimes mentality. you see a malaise as a team, and here's an example when the Mets swept a doubleheader for the Phillies this week. Heading into the eighth inning, they were hitting 128 with runners in scoring position. Heading into the eighth inning of the first game of the doubleheader, then all of a sudden the flood chase open. They drove runners in, and then they tacked three on against Aaron Nola in the, in the next game. Yeah. So sometimes a team can be cold as a unit. Yeah. And it seems, you know, everybody loves to jump on this, too, because the, the expectations are raised with the Mets. You know, and every time they, Jacob DeGrom pitches, they don't give him support. It's like the Mets acting like they're hitting against DeGrom, too. 
but if you give it time, you know, that may turn around. Yeah. And I remind people too, all the time when it comes to baseball, baseball is a, a game of routine and whatever team it is, when your routine is broken in this time of the year, rain outs, and now thinking of dealing with COVID uh, cancellations, you lose that rhythm, you lose that routine. So be mindful of that before you hit any panic buttons. Now, this next picture intrigues me because I have added them in leagues, um, more out of desperation than what I really wanted to. But that's John Gray of the Colorado Rockies. Now, he's less than 30% rostered on Yahoo, but a, a week ago, he was less than 5% rostered. In two starts, 11 and two-thirds innings, ERA, 1-5-4, over nine Ks per nine innings. Um, has a start the night of this recording. He's facing the Dodgers as, as we record this. Last season, he pitched to a 6-6-9. He's got four seasons, or let's say three fulls, two full seasons of an ERA over five. Is John Gray somebody you have any faith in going forward? Or is he somebody we're going to be adding and dropping all year? I think you're going to play yo-yo with him. I mean, he pitched yeah. real well against the Dodgers, but for some reason, he always pitches well against the Dodgers. As a general rule, I do, do not roster Colorado pitchers. They just make me too nervous. You know, Gray's the best of them, obviously. You know, I'd rather take a flyer on Joe Ross, who, you know, has been absolutely dominant. Uh, you know, he opted out last year and he had Tommy John. He has had two starts. He doesn't get a ton of strikeouts, but if you want somebody for the end of your staff, he shut down the Dodgers and the Cardinals. And his game against the East, he's really mixing the sinker slider really well. This guy has had talent. We've just needed him to see him stay healthy. You know, might turn out to be better than his brother was. We thought Tyson was going to have a lot of upside. Yeah but it didn't turn out that way. But nice sinker slider combination, shutting down two really, really good offenses. In fact, against the Cardinals, 15 of the first 20 batters that he faced, first pitch strikes. He's getting ahead of hitters. And it's not like with Matt Boyd where they haven't seen him. You know, there's a book on Joe Ross, and he's been really good so far. I might even want to take a flyer on you know, JT Brubaker has been looking pretty good so far. We talked about the Tigers. You know, the Pirates are, are playing a little bit better yeah. than we expect. You know, and JT Brubaker, he might be able to give me eight, nine Ks per nine, and he's got he's got pretty good stuff, you know, JT Brubaker. I'd, I'd rather take Ross, Ross and Brubaker maybe than, uh, you know, than take a flyer yeah, on a Rockies Brink. pitcher because yeah. I can more comfortably put him in the rotation. And you're having to move a lot of guys in and out because – Alberto Alzale just got sent to the alternate site. Uh, so you probably have to replace him. You know, Alec Mills pitched good for four innings. Maybe you could pitch up, pick up Alec Mills. Uh, so what about Steven Matz, who's off to a terrific start? Steven for, Matz has always team. had the talent. Always. There's, there's two things. Injuries, obviously. And I picked him up this past week in the FSGA. So there you go. Yeah, uh, I mean, he's up to seventy percent rostered. The talent has always been there, and I root for Stephen Matz personally. Okay, Stephen Long Matz, Island kid lives near near. Grew well, up more near than me. that, more than that, our friends at Big League Impact Fantasy uh, Football for charity. Stephen Matz ran the league for the last few years. Uh, great fantasy player, nice guy, big Chicago Bears fan. Sat next to him at drafts and uh, drafted with him, and always talked fantasy football. So I root, I root for Stephen Matt personally, but objectively, uh, the problems were the injuries and always letting the big inning snowball on him. Yeah. Now you get a change of scenery and you get to work with Pete Walker, who's a great pitching coach. The spring was good. Sometimes the spring doesn't always translate to the regular season, but the spring was good. And the first two turns have been excellent. He's definitely worked the pickup. In fact, he might not be out there unless you play in a 10-team league at this point. Yeah. 70% roster, 12 and a third innings, only two earned runs, seven hits, 13 strikeouts in those 12 and a third innings. Uh, looks like a terrific move by Toronto getting him. And, you know, Mets had to move on from him. This was, to me, a change of scenery situation that kind of had to happen. And a great spot for Mets pitched against the Rangers 
and the Angels and has looked good doing it. Somebody else who, again, was undrafted, essentially, in 12-team leagues, skyrocketing up the waiver wire list, and is somebody now, somebody who can help going down the stretch. One last pitcher before we hit halftime. And I watched them pitch the other night for the Miami Marlins. And we talk about Alcantara. And we talked about Elisa Hernandez. And we talked about Pablo Lopez and all those pitchers on the Miami Marlins. But Trevor Rogers of the Marlins against the Mets the other night was throwing ridiculous gas. He was completely untouchable, 66% rostered. What do you think about Rogers? I know you, I'm assuming you saw the game two against the Mets. Uh, he was lights out. And another player who was under the radar just two weeks ago. Yeah, and actually, he's beaten Jacob DeGrom twice in two years. That's how impressive he's been. It's a good point that you make. You know, the Marlins are very good at scouting pitchers, and they always have been historically, if you look at their history. And, uh, you know, this kid, is he's a tough hes a tough lefty. And I, I drafted him actually as maybe like my fifth pitcher in an NL only league. He was really flying under oh. the radar. Yeah, but think but about I, what you just said, Scott. He was a fifth pitcher in an NL only. Yeah. Right? He, that's how low he was. That's how, that's how low he was. But I don't think you can ignore him after what he did. And it's not like that's the first time that the Mets saw him either. So, uh, you know, I, I think he's definitely worth a pickup, but he's probably not available in a lot of leagues. He, he probably got picked up. Yes, right now, according to Yahoo, he's about 66% rostered. I agree with you, 14-team leagues, things like that, he's available. But my question is, um, again, people have added him, 10 innings, 16 strikeouts, 6 walks. Faith that, is it somebody you can foresee having for the rest of the season? Or is it a yo-yo situation? Um, is, is he a pitcher who, you know, one or two bad starts and we cut bait and we move on? I don't think he's a yo-yo pitcher. Okay. Um, I think he's here to stay. And then another one that's probably available in some leagues, but got picked up in a lot is Yaskar Noah of the Atlanta Braves. Mm -hmm. uh, 10 strikeout game after impressive opening turn. This kid always had the stuff. He just needed to get the command. And now the command is there. You know, you're kind of concerned. Okay. When Mike Soroka comes back, Will you know a stay in the rotation, but go with him for now and take while you can get while you can get it before the league maybe adjust to him because double start week while we're recording this, coming off of a big 10K game. Uh, you know, he's he's a hot name in fantasy baseball right now. But uh Max Fried just hit the DL too with yeah. a hamstring injury. So he's gonna get a chance for some turns. He's somebody that I picked up last week as well. Pitched 12 innings so far this year. One relief appearance, two starts, 11 combined innings in those two starts, 15 strikeouts, and you talked about getting the control better. Only two walks so far in those 12 innings. And, and by and, the and, way, by the way, in his first 12 innings pitched this year, Danny Duffy has yes, one he's on the earned list. run. Danny Duffy. And Duffy's always had the talent, but he's always disappointed us. So he's yep. one of those guys that I pick up. But I remain skeptical. You know, some of these guys you pick up, you remain skeptical, but you keep them on your roster, even if you're not going to fit them in and see if he keeps it up. Yep. And that was that was the point of what I wanted to accomplish today. So a pitcher like Duffy, a pitcher like John Gray, there's a little bit of skepticism there because they're older. We, we have the track record. You know, with some of these younger guys like a Trevor Rogers, there's potential for, for a really good uh, uh, end result come the middle of the summer and the end of the year. All right, everybody, like I said at the start, head over to rotaballer.com. Check out everything we have there, including the MLB and NFL premium package, the NASCAR package. Sign up, promo code KING, promo code ACES. And when we return from halftime, we're going to talk the fantasy impact of Gio Bernard's move, James Conner to Arizona. We'll talk a little basketball, and we're going to talk a little FFPC, focusing on the wide receiver position this week. This is the King and Pocket Aces. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.
Welcome back, everybody, to King and Pocket Aces. Second half time, second half kickoff here. Scott Angle, Anthony Aniano, happy to be with you. Scott takes it in. No fair catches for Scott. He's running right through the wedge, and uh, hopefully he comes out of the bottom of the pile in one it, piece. It, <laughs> through, the, through the wedge with Sister Sledge. Yeah, there you go. Well done. Yeah. All right, Scott, as we always do here in the second half of the show, time to talk football, time to talk some basketball. We'll start in the NFL and a couple of free agent moves I wanted to get your thoughts on. First, to me, not as significant, but Gio Bernard uh, signs he's headed to Tampa. Your thoughts on Gio Bernard, uh, I think, being added to a crowded Buccaneers backfield. Makes it, makes it a backfield to avoid here. If I want one guy maybe for to get some carries, it might be Ronald Jones, who looked bet, better last year than I expected. But there's games where, you know, Arians has shown he's going to ride the hot hand if Fournette's playing better than Jones, that he's going to, he's going to use him instead. And now as a receiver, they like Bernard. You know, LaShawn McCoy was pretty much at the end there. They like him for his pass blocking and his pass catching out of the backfield. That's going to hurt Fournette. We know Jones was never really that good at catching passes. So now this becomes a true running back by committee. You know, to me, running back by committee isn't two guys because I've never been on a two-person committee. Three guys here now, that is a committee. And this really, you could look at Indianapolis. You know Jonathan Taylor is probably going to be the lead ball carrier Marlon Mack will get some breathers in there. They'll have some of the hinds. It's a little annoying. I think people are overrating Jonathan Taylor as much as I do like him because he's got to prove it over a full season. And it's a committee. But this is even a tougher committee to call yeah. because there's not a pure standout running back here. And it could be three of them. And Keyshawn Vaughn's still in the mix. And how does he figure in? So I'm going to be avoiding Tampa Bay. Yeah, I agree. And you're, you're right. Like Jonathan, there's three running backs in Indy, but Jonathan Taylor's talent is, is just greater than anybody else on that teams. Whereas now in Tampa and you brought up Keyshawn Fawn at this point, you could see Vaughn Fournette or Jones on any given week, lead the team in carries. You could see Gio Bernard, you know, bring in five catches on any uh, given week. Now I will tell you this. I will not buy into any preseason hype that Tom Brady is suddenly going to turn 30-year-old Gio Bernard into the next James White. I am not buying into that. That is not going to happen. Do not, do not, and, and Scott, if you think I'm wrong, tell me, do not take Gio Bernard late in your draft thinking that's what you're going to get, okay? It's just, it's not, the, 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 you said it, the amount of touches is not going to be there. So just because Brady's there, don't think you're going to get a PPR RB2 out of Gio Bernard. No, because there were times in New England where James White was actually their best receiver. You know, yes. Brady, Brady now plays with the best receiving crew of his career and not even counting Antonio Brown, you know, having Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. He never had anything like that as a pairing. Of course, Randy Moss was probably the best receiver overall he played with but he's never had this much weaponry as his disposal disposal as he has had in tampa bay it is the best supporting cast of his career in terms of offensive compliments Gio bernard is not going to be asked to play a james white kind of role he very often had to throw to james white because outside of edelman there weren't too many good receivers to throw to yeah, absolutely. Now, the other big move, the other big free agent move uh, since we last spoke, James Conner, former Steeler, now going to Arizona. Um, I like it from a football perspective as Scott's couch collapses behind him. Uh, we fumble. <laughs> from a football perspective, I like it for Arizona. James Conner, Chase Edmonds, both guys can run the ball, can catch the ball. Um, you know, doesn't necessarily give away any uh, any. Uh, scheming going on depending on who's on the field but that being said fantasy wise are either of these players somebody you can trust as an rb2 or are we talking round seven round eight third wide receivers a third running back status 
for Connor and Chase Edmonds? I think it's third running back status. You know, we've seen Edmonds flash at times. Uh, we've seen Connor have some good games here, but I think the two complement each other well. James Connor can be a physical inside runner. You can have Edmonds on the perimeter and also catching passes. Uh, it could be a thing of one week James Connor has 80 yards and two touchdowns, and the next week uh, Chase Edmond rip off, rips off the 60 yard run and has uh, you know 110 yards on 10 carries and a touchdown or something like that, or takes a screen pass to the house. So well, both of these guys probably going to be more in the flex conversation and it could be a different one every, any given week. Scott, I, I, I said this to Josh Hayes on, on Sirius XM. I could see both of these running backs going in a draft within 10 rounds of uh, 10 picks of one another, right? Like I could think it's going to be James Conner. You could like Chase Edmonds. And there we are round seven, round eight. And that's where both of them, potentially go off the board yeah i think though people are going to look more at the upside of edmonds and they've already been disappointed in connor so i could see chase edmonds going around eight and james connor around 10 okay i mean and you said it they're not rb2s at right now we view them as a flex play uh running back depth uh on your fantasy roster scott Next thing I wanted to talk about, and I love talking to you about this, and I always defer to you on the FFPC. Uh, last week, we spoke about some of the running backs and their current ADPs in the FFPC. Well, today I wanted to talk to you about wide receivers. Because when I sat down and looked at this list, I noticed Justin Jefferson is the first wide receiver uh, coming off the board. In FFPC, I should say, is dynasty formats. Justin Jefferson is the first wide receiver off the board, going ahead of Devontae Adams, DK Metcalf, Tyree Kill, A.J. Brown, and everybody else. Okay? Hey, listen, Justin Jefferson was great. But Justin Jefferson is still tied to Kirk Cousins, whereas Devontae Adams is still tied to Aaron Rodgers. Uh, uh, am, I, am I wrong in thinking that is just silly with Justin Jefferson? I was talking to Eric Balkman of the FFPC about this on Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio. And it's kind of an agreement. Not that it's necessarily silly, but not something that we would do. Uh, because track record, you know, he's only done it for one year. He's still got to prove he can play at that high level again, especially now when defensive coordinators are going to spend the offseason, especially in that division looking at the film. You know, I like Justin Jefferson. I think he's top 10, uh, dynasty, probably top seven, top eight. But the mistake I think people make in dynasty leagues is overrating the youth and mm -hmm. looking too far into the future, saying, okay, I'll have this guy for the next 10 years. Uh, you just, you want to peer into the future, but not maybe more than th beyond three, four years. You want to win now as well, well as in the future. And some people lose sight of that and they overrate the youth because there's no way right now in any format that I'm taking him at Devontae, over Devontae Adams and Tyreek Hill who are way more proven, tied yeah. to better quarterbacks. You know Aaron Rodgers is at least going to give you another year or two. And Mahomes, you know, that career is going to extend for a while. But, well, you know, these, these guys are proven. They, they help me win now. Not that Jefferson can't help me win now, but I'm not going to suddenly vault him to number one over Adams and Hill based on the youth because Adams and Hill are nowhere near ages where they're going to be end, towards the end of their careers. Yeah. Well, well you mentioned Tyree Kill. Tyree Kill is going at wide receiver five. So not only is he going after Jefferson – and Adams and Metcalf. He's also going after A.J. Brown. Now, don't get me wrong. I love A.J. Brown, but I have a little bit of concern with A.J. Brown going into this season, right? John o. Smith gone, uh, Davis gone. You know, A.J. Brown benefited from a strong receiving core plus the Derrick Henry factor there in Tennessee. That's now been eliminated. And he's, and listen, hey, Ryan Tannehill is good. Okay. Got out of Miami. God bless. But he's not Patrick Mahomes and Tyreek Kill. And A.J. Brown, although it's close, is going slightly ahead of Tyreek Kill, who's going to be tied to Patrick Mahomes for who knows how long, Scott. 
Yeah, I like A.J. Brown a lot. You know, I'm not worried about him losing Corey Davis, John Drew Smith, whatever, because we saw Corey Davis struggle for a long time, Janu Smith battle injuries. To me, he's 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 almost like a miniature DeAndre Hopkins in that no matter what he has around him, he's going to get the ball. He does a great job of posting up defenders and, you know, framing catches and yardage after the catch ability. I don't know if we've even seen, seen the best of A.J. Brown. He just continues to get better. But again, over Devontae Adams, Tyree Kill, you know, these, yeah. these kind of guys who are more proven. Stefan Diggs? Yeah. I mean, any format, Stefan Diggs is the number three wide receiver right now. I don't care what format it is. I am not taking Justin Jefferson over Stefan Diggs. I saw what Stefan Diggs did at times in Minnesota. Now he's playing with Josh Allen. Stefan Diggs is number three off the board to me in any format, dynasty, whatever. Because him and Josh Allen are going to be doing this for a few years. I'm not looking 10 years into the future. I'm not looking eight years into the future. I'll look three years into the future. That's it. it Devontae Adams and Tyree Kill and Stefan Diggs are nowhere near the end. So Stefan Diggs is currently going as wide receiver seven in give this FFPC. Give me the favor. Give me the ages of Hill, Adams, and and digs. Okay, so when you talk about all of them, uh, give me a second to pull up their ages. When you talk about all of them, I want you to get your take on one thing as I pull up those ages up. You talk about Diggs as wide receiver three. He's going as wide receiver seven. He's actually going after um, C.D. Lamb, who's going as wide receiver six. I, I'm, I'm like you. I love C.D. Lamb. You want to put him in a top ten for a dynasty format, I'm all in, but ahead of Stefan Diggs, no. uh, a little bit of a surprise for me. I like C.D. Lamb a lot with a healthy Dak Prescott, okay? But to me, that's looking a little too far into the future. Stefan Diggs can help me win this year more than C.D. Lamb can. I agree. Stefan Diggs, 27 years old. Devontae Adams, 28 years old. And Tyree Kill is sitting at, I think he's the youngest of the bunch. Tyree Kill is sitting at, as we wait for my very slow internet to load up, Tyree Kill is sitting at only 26 years old. No, okay. those guys are nowhere near to be done. This is a mistake sometimes, okay? Because in their minds, a lot of fantasy players will say age 30 is when a guy gets old. You know, that's not for a wide receiver. A you've, t- you've told me that not for yeah. a wide receiver. Yeah, not for a wide receiver. There's been very good studies done by Mike Taglieri of Fantasy Pros that receivers don't really start to truly decline from their superstar counterparts when you compare them until about age 33. There is no way I'm going to take a guy who's 28, 27, 26 going to give me three more years of top shelf production at least, especially with Tyree Kill, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, for another five years. I only care about the next three to five years, you know, three to four years. Three, you know, four tops. These guys are nowhere near being done to the end. You can't look at it as, okay, who am I going to have for the next 10 years? You have to say, who can help me win now and who can help me win Two to three years from now, you got to put it in the middle. Too many dynasty players don't do that. You know, in my dynasty league, I won at my FFPC dynasty last year because people let let Derrick Henry drop to the third round. So, you know, you can take advantage of these things and win your leagues. Scott, what if I told you that there was a 28 year old, eight year pro? who has over 100 receptions four of those eight years, who has over 1,000 receiving, over 1,200 or over 1,100 receiving yards six of those eight years. And he is currently going after a rookie who hasn't, a, a, a soon-to-be rookie who hasn't played a down in the NFL. All right? DeAndre Hopkins going as wide receiver 10. After Jamar Chase, more of the same, okay? How are you disrespecting DeAndre Hopkins 
and the and the resume he has put up with the youth that's still on his side over an undrafted a player hasn't even been drafted yet in Chase. Now look, I respect a lot of players in the high stakes community, and there was a lot of high stakes players that are not doing these sort of things. But you know, there's other people. You know, thankfully, a lot of people play in the FFPC. Go to rotobowler.com slash FFPC for a great deal uh, on your first team if you want to join in. But again, it's it's veering too much youth over experience. How old is DeAndre Hopkins? 28. 28. You're going you're gonna to get at least 28, 29. You're going to get five. at least another three to four, maybe five years out of DeAndre Hopkins. You can't look at it as I want the guy for t- – can't look 10 years into the future in a dynasty league. You have to balance it by saying, I want to win now and a few years from now. Well, it, it's funny you say that too, because if you wanted to win now, the value at wide receiver in these FFPC dynasty formats, at like after the top 15, Scott Keenan Allen, wide receiver 16. Uh, um, Allen Robinson, wide receiver, 18. I know he's tied to That is Golden wonderful value. I won my That's Super my- Flex Dynasty FFPC last year with Allen Robinson as my number one wide receiver. Right. And he's going right now as wide receiver, 18. Kenny Galladay, wide receiver, 25. Uh, Jerry Judy. Uh, talk about people fall, jumping off the, the wagon after one rookie year. Jerry Judy, wide receiver, 27. Uh, DJ Chalk, wide receiver 30. DJ Chalk's about, about to be tied to Trevor Lawrence for the next 10 years. And he's going as wide receiver 30. Scott, there is so much excellent wide receiver value going outside the top 15 of these dynasty leagues. It's absolutely insanity to me. Yeah, when, when you're in a draft, when you're in an FFPC dynasty draft, and they're going on right now, best ball and seasonal, if somebody veers towards youth – and you have the next pick behind them, and you see a guy like Tyreek Hill or Allen Robinson proven and still has good four to five years left, you jump on that because you want to win now. I got Robinson. I can't remember what round it was, but he certainly wasn't one of the first what wasn't one of the first three last year. I, mm-hmm. I don't think it was one of the first four. But everybody this offseason, I've already gotten like four trade offers for Allen Robinson yep. this, this, this offseason that I've turned down in the FFPC. But you're going to find a lot of great competition there in, in the FFPC. You know, this is not to put anybody down for what they're no, doing. No, no, not at all. Uh, you know, it's just looking at things realistically here. Uh, the FFPC gets a lot of high-stakes players who won't do this. But, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of people who will emphasize the youth. Sometimes it works for them. Sometimes it doesn't. Two more. One more question I have for you, and then we'll move on to some NBA talk. Are you as all in as a lot of other fantasy experts on Matthew Stafford to the Rams? Quick yes or no on that. I'm a yes on him. I took him in the seventh round of the Sirius XM free agency, uh, post-free agency draft. Uh, This is the best situation for him of all time. He's going to have a support of a solid running game. He's going to have at least three good receivers there and, uh, you know, good coaching. I like Matthew Stafford as top 10 this year. Okay. So that being said, how excited would you be to walk away with either Robert Woods or Cooper Cup, who are currently wide receivers 33 and 34? I would love to have Robert Woods there and Cooper Cup too. I think Cooper Cup might be in for his most consistent receive, uh, consistent season yet. You know, a lot of the inconsistency I think was doing a play with Jared Goff. He is such a reliable receiver. Yep, absolutely. It's a terrific spot for Stafford and a huge boost to those Ram wide receivers. Scott, let's pivot over here with with the time we have left and talk a little fantasy base basketball. As the fantasy basketball playoffs are on the way, great article on rotaballer.com by Adam Koffler, fantasy basketball playoff strategy and advice. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll defer this to you as the playoffs are knocking on the door. Um, what's the game plan here heading into the fantasy uh, uh, fantasy basketball playoffs? Adam lays it out greatly on uh, 
on Roto Bowler, and he's going to have an article coming up also about which players you have to worry about to be rested and who can replace them. Because I'm dealing this already. I've clinched two playoff berths in both of my leagues so far, one of the FSGA leagues. But something that I'm dealing with constantly, though, is having to stream, especially, you know, if you have daily moves, because certain guys are going to be rested down the stretch. You look at the Clippers with Kawhi Leonard and Paul George, they're going to be rested. That's why you have to have a Reggie Jackson on your roster, because that's going to give an up. And Jackson has shown that he's going to get an opportunity. He's going to make the most of those opportunities, you know, uh, with these injured players, sometimes, you know, the bucks are being very careful with Giannis on the Kupo right now. And that's led Bobby Portis into the lineup. And he's been put posting some really good numbers. The nets, you know, may rest some of their superstars very late in the regular season. And, you know, you have to look for guys like, Bruce Brown, maybe Landry Shamet to step up. Because, and then, you know, what's, what's going to happen with John Wall and the Rockets? You know, the Rockets are out of there. Uh, you know, more opportunities for Jay Sean Tate, who I've picked up. So to me, it's very important to look at two things. And it's also talked about in the Roto Ball article that you have to look at how many games per week a team is playing, which you already do already. But you have to be ready to churn the waiver wire. I'm in front of my – I'm in, in in first place in one of my leagues with daily moves because that's because I almost have executed 100 waiver wire moves this season. Fantasy basketball can be very frustrating when you get to the playoffs because you're going to see some of your best players rested. Mm-hmm. And it might be all about how you work the waiver wire that is going to make the difference. If you play in a league with Fab – Hopefully you've been savvy and, you know, have saved money for something like this. And you also got to watch teams like the Detroit Pistons, you know, is Killian Hayes going to get playing time? Is Corey Joseph going to get playing time? Uh, Some of these guys who are banged up, they're going to sit late in the year and it's going to, it's going to hurt you. And it's, it's, it's really tough to predict, Uh, you know, LeBron, LeBron's probably going to be back towards the end of the month. Anthony Davis towards the beginning of the month. And, the, you know, that is some good news. There you go. Now, Scott, um, how much longer? I'm, I'm going to ask you. I'm not a fantasy basketball player like you are. You've made two playoffs now. Just out of curiosity, really, how when do you time a fantasy basketball season to end? This is just for my own, I guess, own knowledge. Like, right? Football, we always end the week before the season. Baseball, we end on the last day of the regular season with rotisserie. How do you time it in the, in the uh, 82 game? This, they're not even playing 82 this year, but in terms of the season, how much – like, do we end fantasy basketball early to avoid this resting of the superstars? It's come, come up in my mind, you know, that – but that's tough, though, because even if our playoffs were right now, Giannis has been out – Uh, At this point, he's missed eight of the last 13 games. You've been without Anthony Davis and LeBron for a long stretch. So I don't think there's an answer because it's not like football necessarily. I think the most important thing that you have to have when setting up your leagues is daily moves because I'm in two leagues and one of them has weekly moves. And last week, I wasn't sure if Giannis was going to play or not. And I had to leave him in there. And I got a zero from him the whole week, you know, and that happened too with Larry Nance Jr., et cetera. At least when you have daily moves, you're able to go to the waiver wire and pick up streamers, you know, having an injured list, et cetera. So you're, you're able to compensate if Paul George is going to going to rest or, you know, something like that, or Dennis Smith Jr.'s out and Killian Hayes is out. I can stream Corey Joseph tonight You know, I'll do that. Larry Nance is out. I can stream Hartenstein, and he's going to get me some some rebounds and some blocks. That's the most important thing. You got to have daily moves. I agree, and you got to have them in baseball. You got to have them in basketball. Uh, With the way way things are right now, the daily moves is a must. All right, everybody, we're just about out of time. Head over to rootaballer.com and sign up for that basketball, baseball, football, MMA, PGA. 
uh, eSports and NASCAR. Scott and Sean Angle do a great job there on our NASCAR uh, format there. And sign up for those premium packages. Promo code KING, letting him know, letting everybody know Scott sent you or promo code ACES, telling them I sent you and save yourself a little bit of money on those premium packages. Scott, this is always fun, my friend. Great job as always, buddy. Thanks. And remember, there's a full package that encompasses all the sport yes. under one retractable roof. And if you're king, you check out for a special discount. There you go. All right, everybody. Stay smart. Stay safe. We'll see you next time. This has been the King and Pocket Aces. Have a good one, folks. <laughs>